think we should start. Okay, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to have Nicola Garofalo today. So it's, uh, it's very easy to introduce Nicola because he's one of the most famous uh, pe person, one of the most famous people working in partial differential equations, free boundary problems, uh, um, sub elliptic geometry, uh, uh, sub Riemannian geometry, sub elliptic equation that generate and singular equations. So, Today, he will talk about a heat equation approach to some problem in conformal geometry. And I know that uh, the heat equation type uh, perspectives are one of his uh, favorites, uh, favorite lines of research. So I am very happy to have Nicola here today. Thanks a lot. Okay. Well, uh, so can I, I guess I can start then <laughs> after. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, thank you, Enrico, for the very kind words. And uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> let me make sure that. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, and uh, and for the invitation to speak in the seminar. Uh, I never been to Australia. I, I had to cancel. Uh, at the last moment, an invitation for Nick Trudinger, unfortunately, uh, because one of our kids was about to be born. And my first and last trip to Asia was uh, back in 1978, uh, when I had a beautiful uh, visit to China. Uh, so it's very nice to be visiting, although remotely, the Asia Pacific region again, after such a long time. and. Uh, uh, I, I also want to thank uh, Ben for his uh, precious help, uh, you know, during the past few days with, uh, uh, with setting up all the logistics. So uh, anyhow, so since uh, 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 Enrico is uh, the chair, I mean, uh, it's, uh, here is a pic of uh, the sunset in Perth which uh, I have missed, uh, I guess. Uh, I, I will probably miss by a few hours. So anyhow, so uh, in this talk, I will present some recent joint works with uh, Giulio Tralli, which uh, revolve around the heat equation in a class of uh, geometric ambients, which uh, uh, are of uh, considerable interest in the applied sciences. In fact, uh, the origin of uh, this ambience uh, comes from uh, problems in quantum mechanics. Uh, and then more recently, uh, there has been uh, interesting uh, applications of physics of semi-flexible polymers non-holonomic mechanics. This is actually one of the big historical uh, motivations in the foundational work of uh, Elie Cartan and his uh, famous uh, uh, address at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Bologna back in 1928. So these geometric ambients are, uh, uh, they model physical systems with constraint dynamics, uh, which means that motion is only possible in a prescribed sets of direction in the tangent space. So there is uh, sub-Riemannian versus uh, Riemannian geometry. And uh, the key redeeming feature of uh, uh, this ambience is that the missing directions in the tangent space are recovered by taking a sufficiently large number of commutators or the vector fields which describe the relevant PDEs. So uh, the relevant framework here, the tangent space will be non-abelian Lie groups. Uh, so these are Riemannian manifolds with a smooth non-commutative group law, uh, whose Lie algebra possesses a, a special layer structure suggested by the problem at hand. So for each problem, uh, you have to kind of, uh, uh, you know, adjust the uh, layering of the Lie algebra to the problem that you are considering. The most important of these Lie groups is uh, the ubiquitous two n plus one dimensional Heisenberg group, which was first introduced by Hermann Weyl. Uh, then, uh, uh, you know, the situation has evolved over the years. And uh, so at, uh, at some point in my, in my talk, I will switch from the model Heisenberg group to a more general class of Lie groups, which are modeled on the Heisenberg group. 
So, but coming back to the Heisenberg group, uh, it is equipped with a conformal invariant partial differential operator, the so-called uh, horizontal Laplacian. This is actually uh, uh, the real part of the Cohn Spencer sub Laplacian. So, and uh, it is of interest for uh, uh, numbers, let's say S between zero and one to consider uh, fractional powers of this operator. Now I will indicate in my talk with L upper S the fractional powers, the standard fractional powers minus L. Minus L is a positive operator, it's self-adjoint. And uh, uh, so the first natural question uh, arises is uh, whether these non-local operators retain the geometric properties of minus L. And unfortunately, unlike what happens for the standard Laplacian, these pseudo differential operators, L upper S, do not preserve conformal invariances of the local operator L. So uh, the focus of my talk will instead be on a class of non local operators that are conformal invariant in the Eisenberg group or more in general, Lie groups of Eisenberg type. And I will denote these non-local operators, which I will introduce uh, shortly with uh, uh, the symbol L lower S to distinguish them from uh, the standard fractional powers L upper S. Uh, and uh, these operators L lower S, they actually arise in uh, uh, Cauchy-Riemann geometry. And uh, the objective of my talk is to present a new approach based on the heat equation and some variants of it to uh, the following three issues. So prove the invertibility of the fractional powers L lower S, find explicit formulas for the fundamental solution of L over S and uh, prove some intertwining formulas for L over S which are connected the conformal fractional CR Yamabe problem, which is uh, uh, indicated uh, here. The equation is here, and uh, this has a geometric meaning. And I will come back to this equation uh, later on. Now, uh, the meaning of the word intertwining in the, the, this, the role of this number Q, which as you see, uh, by analogy with the standard uh, Yamabe problem uh, or fractional Yamabe problem is uh, is uh, will be explained will be clarified uh, very briefly in uh, in my talk. So, <clears throat> so I will start with discussing a model question, which uh, I will, as I will show, encompasses uh, parts uh, one to three of the plan of my talk. So let me go back to the uh, to an object that is very well known is uh, the fractional powers of the standard Laplacian. These pseudo differential operators uh, uh, can be given, can be uh, defined uh, using Fourier transform by this formula. This formula is well known to be equivalent to the Marcel Ries 1938 definition of the fractional Laplacian, standard definition of the fractional Laplacian. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, there is this formula, this beautiful formula that holds. So when you apply the fractional Laplacian to this object, to this function here, think of Y as a, a parameter, as a free parameter. It ranges in the positive uh, real line. So if you apply uh, the fractional Laplacian to this uh, object here, you get uh, the right hand side. Notice that uh, uh, this formula uh, changes in a very interesting way if you just change s into minus s and that is uh, a little starts giving you a hint of where the word intertwining is coming from all right so um, a direct proof of this formula this formula zero one which is called an intertwining formula um, is by Fourier transform and uh, ultimately, it's a non-trivial proof. It ultimately hinges on some integral formulas involving special functions. Uh, a, uh, a proof of that uh, formula zero one is at least known since the celebrated 1983 work of Elliot Lieb concerning best constants in the Hardy-Little-Boot-Sobolev inequalities. 
um, if you are interested uh, in a, a full proof of that formula, you can look up my uh, survey article uh, listed down here. So uh, <clears throat> an immediate consequence of this formula is that it produces uh, a one parameter family of uh, uh, global solutions to the non-local Yamabe equation written here. Okay, when S is equal to one, this becomes the standard Yamabe equation. Otherwise, uh, you know, there is a fractional version of this equation, this problem, and it's, uh, and the relevant PDE is uh, written there. All right, so to introduce the main theme of my talk, I will now present an alternative heat equation proof of this formula zero one, which as you will see, uh, uses very, very elementary arguments. There are no, there is no Fourier transform. Uh, there is no uh, special functions involved, but very elementary facts just using the heat equation. So instead of considering the uh, standard power of the, of the Laplacian, so let me consider the fractional heat operator. So DDT, I'm trying to see how I can move. Uh, you can all see my page, right? Uh, everything is fine uh, concerning. En Enrico, I'm sorry, I have to ask, uh, uh, you know, is yeah, yeah, okay? I, I can okay. see the, the slide perfectly. Okay, all right. So let's consider the, fra so the fractional heat operator instead uh, of uh, the uh, fractional Laplacian. And let's consider the so-called extension problem for the fractional uh, heat operator. So that means uh, given a function F in the thin space uh, Rn cross Rr, so with respect to variable respectively X and T, uh, we seek to find a function capital U in, uh, in uh, the thick space. So I'm augmenting the space of one dimension, this dimension Y, such that uh, uh, capital U solves this PDE and uh, uh, U satisfies a Dirichlet condition. Be careful, we are dealing with a parabolic operator, but we are imposing a Dirichlet condition at y equal to zero. So this uh, Dirichlet problem was first introduced uh, uh, when s is equal to one half in a beautiful, but not so well known 1968 pioneering paper by Frank Jones. And actually Jones constructed for the first time an explicit Poisson kernel for this problem. And he gave a representation of solutions, an explicit representation of solution in terms of this Poisson kernel. It's unfortunately this paper by Frank Jones uh, went uh, overlooked in the literature because uh, uh, it was the first paper in which the extension problem was actually uh, explicitly defined and, uh, and solved. So uh, I now make the claim that the conformal invariances uh, uh, hidden in this uh, formula zero one are uh, in fact uh, uh, contained or embedded in the fundamental solution of the differential operator appearing in this formula here. So let me show you how. Um, well, first of all, let's notice that if we take W to be a vector in the fractional space R2, one minus S, okay? And uh, we denote be with Y the norm of W, never mind the fact that we're in a fractional uh, Euclidean space. So then PS represents the action on cylindrically symmetric functions in uh, uh, the variable W of the heat operator written here. And uh, know very well what the fundamental solution of this operator is, is the product of the two Gaussians. So this is the, the standard Weierstrass, Gauss-Weierstrass kernel in the variable X and T, and this is the standard Gauss-Weierstrass kernel in the variable uh, W and T. Remember that Y is the norm of W. Okay, so I will denote this function with Q up S, and uh, let me denote also with Q minus upper minus S, the heat kernel obtained by replacing S into minus S 
in this formula 0, 04, then we know by Bochner subordination that uh, the two functions obtained in integrating in time q upper s and q upper minus s are respectively the fundamental solutions of the two time independent differential operators written here. All right, so now it's an easy calculation, but very important that if we integrate in time uh, these two objects here, uh, then we get uh, these uh, two functions. And these are precisely the two intertwining functions that you've seen appearing in formula zero one. All right, so once you make this observation, then uh, you see, you recognize immediately that proving zero one now is uh, becomes equivalent to establishing the dimension free intertwining relation minus Laplace and S applied to E upper S. Remember that E upper S and E upper minus S are defined by this formula here. So I'm applying the Laplace and the fractional Laplace to this object here. So this is equal to two, I mean, this is a, just a scaling factor and then you have E minus S. So notice that, uh, uh, you know, said it in this way, this formula 07 is completely equivalent, of course, uh, because of this observation down here, okay? It's completely equivalent to formula 01. And therefore, uh, now, we are, now we want to prove 07. And that's what I will prove for you <clears throat> in the next slide. So, but before uh, doing that, uh, I want to take out Fourier transform from the picture, not because I don't like Fourier transform, but simply because uh, uh, it would not be appropriate to reintroduce Fourier transform at this moment. And instead, I want to use the heat equation based definition of the fractional powers of the Laplacian, which goes back to the beautiful work of Balakrishnan, in fact, his PhD thesis in 1954 under the supervision of Ralph Phillips. So Balakrishnan introduced uh, uh, a heat equation based definition of the fractional powers of any operator, closed operator on a Banach space through this formula here. So um, as soon as you have, uh, if you have, uh, uh, if your operator is the generator of a semi-group, in this case, I mean, I will take the standard uh, heat semigroup and by parts. I can this formula like this. So now I'm back to computing minus Laplacian of function f equal to e upper s. Okay, so <clears throat> here is uh, pt applied to e upper s. Remember, the definition of e upper s is the integral between zero and infinity of the heat kernel, which is written here. So if I use the semi-group property of PT, the, this object here, which I need to compute this formula is simply this. And so now at this point, you make a simple but important change of variable. Okay, so you switch from variables T and tau to variables U and V uh, through this uh, relationship here and then you integrate by parts and then after some elementary computations, which I'll, uh, I will spare, you see these are simple uh, change. There is a change of variable and then an integration by parts in this formula. And then you end up with the fact that uh, minus Laplacian of E upper S is equal to this object here. And in a way you have separated the variables. Okay, so at this point, you make a, a very simple observation. Uh, this integral is equal to this. And then we reach the conclusion that this formula, the intertwining formula is true. Because when you substitute the information that I just showed you in here, so then uh, we have proved this formula here. And therefore, formula zero one is also true. So you see, this is a very elementary heat equation proof of this important intertwining formula. And I hope to show you how important this formula is by the, what I'm about to say. So one of the objectives of my talk is to present a version of this formula zero one in which minus Laplacian to the S is replaced by the conformal fractional uh, horizontal Laplacian L lower S. In, uh, in the geometric ambient will be that of a Lie group of Eisenberg type G. Okay, so it's time to introduce the relevant geometric framework. 
let me start with a model. So um, the Heisenberg Group HN, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this group, just think of it as R2N plus one. This group comes from complex geometry, but uh, I will not dwell too much on this uh, uh, aspect. Uh, otherwise, I will take the whole uh, the remainder of my talk, and I see that I'm already uh, uh, behind on my uh, uh, schedule here. So uh, let's consider a 2n by 2n symplectic matrix J written here. And uh, let's introduce in R2n plus one a non commutative group law, which is written here. Okay, well, uh, this is just a rotation, uh, you know, uh, it changes uh, a vector into its perpendicular. Okay, so, and uh, with this non commutative group law, uh, uh, R2n plus one becomes a Lie group, and uh, this Lie group is usually uh, denoted by uh, Hn for Heisenberg group, although physicists have long known this as the, Bly, the Weyl group. All right, so let me denote by uh, Z sigma and Z prime sigma prime generic points in HN. So remember, we have uh, Z is in R2N and sigma is the so-called vertical direction, okay? Uh, then I will denote by L sub G the left translations induced by this group law. And then there is uh, the vector fields, which, uh, you know, uh, which are invariant under this uh, uh, left translation, which uh, is there listed here. So this is a basis for the Lie algebra of all left invariant vector fields in, uh, uh, with respect to this group law here. All right, so you obtain this vector field simply applying the differential of LG to the standard basis in R2n plus one. Or, okay, so these vector fields um, are very important because, uh, uh, you know, if you commute uh, any of two, any two of these vector fields, you will get zero except in one instance, okay, and that instance is right here. So if you take the commutator between xi and xn plus j, you will get uh, a multiple uh, of the vertical DD sigma vector field. So the uh, DD sigma is the so-called Reeb vector field in CR geometry, but for I will sweep under the rug this uh, fact for the moment. So the horizontal Laplacian is uh, this object here. So is this differential operator of order two, you take the square of the vector fields, the horizontal vector fields xj, Okay, and uh, is this operator, this operator, if you check, it's a simple computation, this operator fails to be elliptic at every point of Rn, one of the eigenvalues of the quadratic form is identically equal to zero, but it has one fundamental redeeming feature, and it's uh, written here in this star. And according to a famous uh, uh, theorem, 1967 theorem by Ormander, this star, uh, identity is sufficient to, uh, in fact, in this case, it's necessary and sufficient to uh, uh, decide the hyperlipticity of this operator here. So this operator is not elliptic, but it's hyperlyptic. So it shares one important aspect with the standard Laplacian. So if we assign the formal degree J to corresponding layer of the Lie algebra, so we have the horizontal layer and then we have the DD sigma uh, layer. So sign degree one to the horizontal layer and degree two to the vertical layer because in order to generate the vertical layer we need one commutator. All right. So then uh, there is uh, a, a, a there is a standard procedure to associate non-isotropic dilations to this ambience, and in this case since we have only two layers then we have uh, the dilations which are in essence the same dilations of the heat equation so it's lambda z lambda square sigma so the direction sigma counts twice so with respect to this dilation the operator written here it's an easy check it's a, a homogeneous operator of degree two like the standard laplacian with respect to the euclidean dilations all right, so now let me introduce uh, the so-called homogeneous dimension. So the homogeneous dimension uh, 
associated with the group is not the topological dimension, which is 2n plus 1, but is 2n plus 2 because the vertical direction counts twice. And the Lebesgue measure, which is a bi-invariant haha measure on this group, uh, interacts with the group dilations according to this formula. And this is why this number Q is called the homogeneous dimension associated with the group. All right, so now let me consider this remarkable function here, which is known as the Korani gauge. The, uh, so this function uh, uh, notice acts as, so this is homogeneous of degree one with respect to the dilations, uh, the non-isotropic dilations. And uh, there is a beautiful fact which was discovered by uh, Jerry Folland in 1973. Uh, power, the appropriate power of this function uh, represents, uh, gives you the fundamental solution with polar the group identity of the horizontal Laplacian minus cell in HN. And you know, there is a no notable resemblance between this fact, this theorem of Folland, and the classical theorem for the Laplacian in dimension bigger than or equal than three that gives you the fundamental solution as uh, the norm to the power two minus n. All right, but uh, the similarities are just on the surface. So as you will uh, uh, shortly see. So I'll come back to this result by Folland at the very end of my talk and show you that by running the heat flow in HN, we can actually discover the magic gauge function N and recover Folland's theorem as the limiting case in the limit as S goes to one of a family of fractional theorems. So returning to the Eisenberg groups, so I will uh, uh, emphasize one more time, we have two layers, the horizontal layer, so the variable Z and R to N, and then the vertical layer, the variable Sigma. Okay, so we could generalize this uh, uh, thing. In fact, uh, Eli Stein in his uh, address at the Nice International Congress of Mathematicians in 1970, he laid down a program, a visionary program that uh, put this group's generalization of the Heisenberg group. Nowadays, they are called Carnot groups. They were, they were, they were rechristened Carnot groups uh, by uh, Gromov. Uh, you know, they put them at the, uh, uh, at the center of the analysis of uh, so-called Oper operators of Orman the type. Because in essence, uh, there is a fundamental theorem which is due to, fall, to uh, uh, Rothschild and Stein that tells you that uh, when you're looking at one of these Orman the type operators, then you have to look at the Carnot group that acts as uh, uh, tangent space, but uh, that's uh, really a, a misrepresentation of the result, but just for the sake of it, think of it as a tangent space at the identity. Of Element. So these Carnot groups play a central role in the analysis of these operators. And uh, so I will uh, introduce them very briefly now. So a Carnot group of step R is simply is a Lie group whose Lie algebra can be broken into direct sum of R layers. And there is a nil potency and generating assumption. The nil potency is right here and the generating, the bracket generating assumption is right here. So when you commute V1 with the next layer, you get the subsequent layer. All right. So now let me introduce in a general Carnot group G uh, with a fixed horizontal Laplacian L, let me introduce the heat semigroup. This was constructed by Folland in 1975. And uh, so there is this uh, positive uh, heat kernel, okay? And uh, this heat semigroup is uh, stochastically complete in the sense that PT of one is one. So this semigroup is all that is needed to study the non-conformal fractional powers L up S, okay? And the one way to effectively do this is again, to look at the uh, uh, Balakrishnan formula, which is I've recalled here. Now we use this semigroup here and this uh, uh, allows us in the absence of Fourier transform, we no longer have Fourier transform at this point. So this allows us to very effectively analyze this operator and carry the analysis all the way. So we can, uh, for instance, 
uh, define the risk potentials. Uh, this is a heat semigroup based definition of the heat potential, completely equivalent to the definition of the standard definition of Marcel Ries. And these heat potentials here, in fact, they invert the, <clears throat> the fractional powers of uh, uh, the sub Laplacian, so the, this horizontal Laplacian. And this is uh, encoded in this formula here, in this very important formula. Now, when you look at this formula and you start working on it, you realize that this is not a big deal, uh, you know, and it's very easy, it's relatively easy to prove this formula, okay? So uh, a direct important consequence of this uh, inversion formula is that the kernel of this uh, Ries potential represents the fundamental solution of the non-local operator L upper S. And in fact, you know, uh, and therefore, so if you go back to the familiar Rn and uh, we look at the, then the sub the horizontal Laplacian is nothing else than the standard Laplacian. Then uh, this uh, uh, identity here produces as a fundamental solution, this function here, this explicit function here. And this is a classical form that Marcel Ries had proved in a different way uh, in his, uh, uh, in his pioneering uh, 1937 paper. So, uh, so once you look at this result, and uh, you remember for a moment, uh, Folland's result in the case S equal to one, then you think, well, could, could it be that uh, this fractional powers L upper S uh, have produced, uh, you know, operators whose fundamental solution is given by the appropriate power of the gauge function of the Korani gauge. But this guess, unfortunately or fortunately, is completely wrong. So the distribution defined by the right hand side of this uh, formula here is not uh, a function of the gauge, except in the limiting case, the local case, when s goes to one, which recovers Folland's theorem. So, and as I mentioned in uh, my preface, there is another pseudo differential operators which I have called a lower S, very different from a upper S and whose fundamental solution does instead what you want here. And uh, that hints to conformal invariances of this operator L over S, but this is where my story begins, okay? So this is a small glimpse of things to come. So, let me recap the situation in, for the Euclidean case. So we have minus delta fundamental solution. This operator is, as we know, conformal through uh, you know, classical fats and the Laplace Beltrami operator and so forth. So uh, minus Laplacian to the S is also conformal. It changes uh, in a nice way when you change uh, uh, the metric. And the fundamental solution, as I just showed you, uh, is given by this object here. Then uh, let's move to the Heisenberg group with horizontal Laplacian, Korani gauge, and homogeneous dimension Q. So this operator is conformal. It's not clear what I'm meaning by this at this moment, but uh, I hope to make it clear when I start making a little detour into geometry. So the operator L upper S is not conformal, no gauge symmetry here for the fundamental solution. The operator L lower S will have, as you will see, a fundamental solution, which is given by this formula. So notice the resemblance between this and this. And this operator will be conformal in a precise geometric sense, okay? So uh, unlike the operator L upper S, the operator L lower S is uh, uh, the definition of the operator L lower S is uh, all but explicit and it's fairly difficult to handle. The first time that uh, a definition was explicitly written was in the 2013 annals paper by Tom Branson, Fontana and Morpurgo. They introduced in the Eisenberg group this pseudo differential operators uh, given by the spectral formula written here. Here gamma is the standard Euler gamma function. 
And you see that if you put s equal to one in this formally, you cannot, but let's suppose that we can put formally s equal to one in this formula. So this term drops, this becomes one. So we have this plus one. So if we apply this classical fact about the gamma function, then we recognize that L over one coincides with minus L. And it's easy to prove that L upper S converges to minus L as S goes to one. So it's only in the local case S equal to one that the two operators L over S and L upper S do coincide. Otherwise they are very different operator. This definition uh, comes from, uh, you know, an intuition, uh, beautiful uh, um, uh, facts introduced by uh, Tom Branson back in 1995 in the paper that I quoted down here. All right, so now, um, well, I'm saying in their cited work, but in fact, I mean, the citation of this work is only at the very end of my talk. So Rupert Frank, Maria del Mar Gonzalez, Monticelli and Tan have introduced in the, uh, you know, in the setting of the Heisenberg group, a new extension problem that which they call the CR extension problem for the fractional powers L lower S. And the extension problem is written here. Okay, notice that uh, I've written in blue this term. So if that term was not there, this extension problem would just be the counterpart of the, of the classical caffarelli sylvester extension problem for the uh, fractional powers L upper S, okay? However, there is this term here and this complicates matter considerably on the one end. On the other end, that term is very important because it introduces geometric meaning into the extension problem. So the extension problem I want to re-emphasize the extension problem of Frank Gonzalez, Monticelli and Tan is not the caffarelli sylvester extension problem as we know it. In order for that to be the case, this term should not be here. So let's look at this problem. And one beautiful fact that was uh, proved by Frank and uh, the other co-authors is this uh, uh, fundamental weighted directly to Neumann relation for the operator L over S. So in other words, if you take a solution to this extension problem, you take the condition, explicit constant, you recover the fractional power L lower S introduced in this formula here. I mean, that takes work, but it's, it was done in this paper of Frank Gonzalez Monticelli and Tra. Okay, in which they used, uh, <clears throat> um, well, I'm, let me get ahead of myself. So uh, I'm running out of time. So uh, hyperbolic geometry and scattering. So, uh, so let's, uh, uh, where does this problem come from? Let me show you where this problem comes from. Because one might look at this problem and say, how did they put that factor in blue in that formula? I mean, uh, is there a rational for it? And the rational, in order to see the rational, you have to connect now the Heisenberg group to complex hyperbolic geometry. So let's look now, notice that this is no longer the Heisenberg group. This is complex hyperbolic space with the lower N and with the upper N without the C, that will be the Heisenberg group. So let me consider complex hyperbolic space. So I will look at Hn cross zero infinity. And uh, I will endow this uh, uh, ambient with the Riemannian metric with respect to which these two n plus two vector fields are form an orthonormal frame of the tangent space. So a computation shows you that uh, Laplace Beltrami operator. Now I'm looking at the Riemannian metric so I can compute the Laplace Beltrami operator which is given by this formula. This is the levi civita connection with respect to this uh, Riemannian metric. And then uh, if you compute the standard Laplace Beltrami operator, you get this formula here. Okay, so look at this formula very carefully because this term has appeared. There is a minus here that is bothering you at this moment, but let's wait for a moment. Let's be faithful. And let's look at this uh, uh, transformation here. So let's move 
let's so upper u is a function that lives in uh, complex hyperbolic space and now i define a function little u through this formula here and then i look at the scattering eigenvalue problem in complex hyperbolic space which is uh, look at uh, this operator here so this is the scattering operator and uh, this is related to the fact that s equal q over 2 is the bottom of the spectrum of the Laplace operator in complex hyperbolic space. So if I apply the Laplace Beltrami operator to this function little u, we get this power y times this differential acting on capital U. And so when you look at this formula, you understand where the extension problem is coming from. The extension problem is coming from the equivalence between the Heisenberg group as the boundary of complex hyperbolic space and the Heisenberg group as I have defined it at the beginning. So we realized that the little function little u is a solution of this uh, eigenvalue of the scattering eigenvalue problem if and only if capital U is a solution to the Frank et al extension problem in the Heisenberg group cross Rn R plus Y. All right. So now let me move to uh, a papers, a couple of papers by um, Enrico. How much time am I left with? Because uh, as you see, I'm very much behind with my slides. So. Well, I would not interrupt you. I mean, once you are here in Australia, no, no. And then we become very upset because for him it's uh, almost dinner time, or it's past dinner time. So that's yeah. a dangerous statement that if that if you say that you will not interrupt me. So, no, but realistically, how much time do I have? Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for sure, a quarter of hour is at your disposal. Okay. All right. So then I'm rich. All right. Thank yeah. you very much, Ben. I hope you. You don't uh, mind what Enrico just this commitment of Enrico to 15 yeah. minutes. Uh, sure. <laughs> all right. So, so uh, in in their work, uh, the, the, there is a couple of uh, very beautiful paper by Lustron Kahl and Veluma uh, uh, Tangavelu, in which they use a parabolic version like the one that I showed you before, introduced by Frank Jones. The parabol parabolic version of the extension problem of Frank et al. Uh, combined with non-commutative harmonic analysis and group representation theory, there is a lot of machinery to establish some beautiful sharp hard inequalities on the Eisenberg group or more in general in groups of Eisenberg type. And then uh, with the, in uh, my work with Giulio Tralli, we took the steps from, we were inspired by these uh, uh, papers of uh, Roncal and Trancavelu, and we turned, uh, we turned the corner and went uh, into a different direction and used this uh, idea of using the heat equation to, uh, uh, to combine uh, the heat equation approach in a systematic way with properties of the specific parabolic extension problem. And, uh, and so and that's what I want to uh, talk to you about right now. So I will move now to a Lie group of, Eisen of Eisenberg types. So think of it as simply a generalization of the Heisenberg group in which the Lie algebra now has two layers, V1, which I will continue to call the horizontal layer, and V2, which I call the vertical layer. The difference with the situation of the Eisenberg group is now that V2 uh, can, have has, can have a dimension which is completely arbitrary. This is not just an academic generalization of the Eisenberg group because these Lie groups do occur in practice, in nature. In fact, uh, you know, uh, in the fundamental work of most of on simple group of, uh, uh, if you look at the, a semi-simple Lie group of rank one, then there is a famous decomposition, which is called the Iwasawa decomposition. If you take the nil potent in the Iwasawa decomposition, that is a Lie group of Eisenberg type. So there is in nature a plentiful supply of such groups and uh, they also have become even they have acquired an even more prominent stature over the 
the past 20 years uh, because uh, physicists have started uh, to connect these groups to uh, some important work in the physics of uh, semi-flexible polymers. So the, uh, I will denote by a little g the generic point, and I will identify this with its coordinates in the Lie algebra. So I will identify the Lie algebra with Rm cross Rk. M and K are respectively the dimensions of the horizontal layer and the vertical layer. So this identification, uh, it's standard because the exponential map is a global diffeomorphism onto the Lie algebra. So we have one single, uh, uh, you know, coordinate map uh, for, the, for the whole group. So uh, as before, the group of anisotropic dilation is again uh, lambda z lambda square sigma. Now the only difference is that sigma is, uh, in, uh, is in higher dimensional space. And there is again the homogeneous dimension attached to this, which will be this number here. Okay, so uh, the, there is an important fact: what characterizes a group uh, has a group of a group of step two as a group of Eisenberg type. It's the Kaplan, the so-called Kaplan mapping from the vertical layer to endomorphisms of the horizontal layer. This mapping is defined here. And uh, when this mapping satisfies this property here, then you say that the group is of Eisenberg type. Okay, so notice that uh, this assumption induces a complex structure on the group. And in fact, the dimension of the horizontal layer will always be even as in the Eisenberg group. All right, so uh, Hulaniki, Gabo, and Chigan constructed uh, a heat kernel, an explicit heat kernel up to Fourier transform along the vertical layer, and it's, get, and it's given here. If uh, uh, they used the group representation theory and it's a pretty heavy machinery, if you want to see a completely self-contained PDE proof of this formula, you can look up uh, this paper on mine with Giulio Tralli, which you can find in Archive. Uh, that will give you a very explicit self-contained uh, proof without using any group representation, nothing, okay? So uh, anyhow, there is this explicit formula. So I will use this formula and variant of it to introduce a definition of L lower S, which is different from the spectral definition that I quoted before from uh, Branson, Fontana, and Morpurgo. So uh, let me look at the now parabolic, uh, the, you know, the parabolic extension problem associated with L lower S. So it's, it's gonna be this one, okay? So this is uh, the parabolic extension problem. And uh, the big fact about this, notice that there is the blue term that differentiates this problem drastically from the extension problem of Frank Jones. If this term was not here, then this would be just an extension problem a la Frank Jones. But this is very different now from the extension problem a la Frank Jones. And there is a big fact uh, after we looked for a while at this operator is we recognized that uh, the fundamental solution of this operator, this differential operator P over S can be computed explicitly. And the reason for this, and I will show you now in the next slide, is that uh, the fun this operator becomes a, a parabolic version of the so-called bowendi grushin operator in a space with fractal dimension. And yet the space is written here. So here is the derivation. So you look at uh, at this operator here, you realize that this is the radial part of a standard Laplacian, okay? So then if you keep that in mind, you see that the extension operator becomes this in coordinate W, W is in the fractional uh, Euclidean space R2, one minus S. Then there is this term, this blue term here. Then there is the, sub the horizontal Laplacian and then there is minus DT of U. Aha, when you look at this thing, you say, well, uh, <clears throat> but now let me look at, the, so by uh, the maximum principle or, uh, you know, uh, symmetry consideration, the fundamental solution must be spherically symmetric with respect uh, to the variable Z, okay? So, and if you impose this condition, you see that uh, this is the expression 
of the horizontal Laplacian in a group of Eisenberg type. But when you have this extra added symmetry, then something cancels. And it's this symplectic term here. There are uh, this uh, K symplectic operators that really mess up the situation for you quite badly, but they cancel because now you're looking at function U, which are spherically symmetric in the horizontal variable Z. And then the operator becomes this one. Wow, once you look at this, this is a parabolic bowen Grushin equation, and we uh, could compute in this paper explicitly a fundamental solution in terms of a Fourier integral uh, along the group center. And here it is. So we have an explicit fundamental solution for the parabolic uh, extension operator in the conformal case. All right, so with this fundamental solution, now we look also at the intertwined operator, the one in which I change S into minus S. And then uh, we have this Bessel intertwining relations that we can exploit. Uh, and uh, now to unravel the conformal geometry in this parabolic extension problem, let's note as I did in the standard case of the heat equation that uh, by Bochner subordination, the integral in time of this fundamental solution gives you the fundamental solution of the, uh, uh, you know, the CR extension operator written here. When we are in the case of the Heisenberg group, this and when this is just DD sigma, so one dimension, this becomes the Frank, uh, Maria del Mar Gonzalez, Monticelli and Tan uh, uh, extension operator, all right? So, and this now observation leads me to introduce the first result. So consider this monster constant. I mean, never mind. Uh, it's an explicit constant that we can actually compute. This constant is hiding uh, the poles of uh, this uh, uh, pseudo differential operators. So uh, then we have the first theorem. So in any group of Eisenberg type, if uh, I consider the distribution defined by this formula here, okay, then that distribution has an explicit, uh, an explicit phase. It's right here. Notice that uh, uh, M plus 2K is the homogeneous dimension of the group. So here there is written Q minus 2S. That's very interesting, okay? And another interesting thing is that this is not a function of the gauge. There is this, if Y was zero, this would be the Korani gauge, but it's not, okay? So that term has to be there. And uh, this theorem here represents the CR counterpart of the above mentioned simple formula when we looked at the case of the heat equation that was giving us this, okay? So once we have that, then um, uh, with the, we can reduce the, you know, the, uh, the problem of understanding what is LS of uh, this monster function here to a dimension-free problem. It's, this is an intertwining. So, and this theorem and this relationship, in fact, is a theorem that we can prove, okay? Uh, but I haven't told you what is the definition of L lower S yet. So when I say that I'm applying L over S to this function, I have not told you what do I mean by L over S? Because I only told you in the case of the Heisenberg group, uh, you know, the messy definition of L over S using the spectral theorem. All right, so it's time now. So then uh, we have theorem number three that says that L over S, and again, I have to tell you what I mean by that, applied to this function produces this function here. And this is the equivalent, the, uh, you know, the conformal CR geometry equivalent of the little uh, intertwining formula I started from in the classical case. And so you immediately get solutions of the fractional uh, CR Yamabe equation, where now the, the relevant uh, uh, pseudo differential operator in the left hand side is this L lower S. So, well, I mean, I will skip the uh, few words for the non expert where that term, uh, you know, where this uh, uh, 
uh, why square comes in here, it, it, it has to do with conformal geometry, the, the Calais transform and so on and so forth. So I will skip this. And uh, let me go now to the definition of uh, L over S, which I will adopt. So if this was the standard heat semi-group, this would be just a Balakrishnan definition of L upper S. But now I'm using this P minus S comma T. <coughs> and in order to understand where this P minus S comma T is, I have to do some rescalings. And uh, here I will, uh, you know, there is some uh, things to explain, but I cannot do it. Uh, so I will just take the to the thin space of the fundamental solution of the extension problem. So y is equal to zero. And I will multiply it by this scaling factor, okay? And I will call k minus s, the corresponding thing changing s into minus s. And I will uh, now uh, <clears throat> call ks this object that I've just introduced. There is an explicit formula, right? Using the fact that we have an explicit formula for qs, I wrote it for you before. And uh, I will define out these two operators, p over plus or minus s comma t. Okay, and then I will use one operator to define the conformal Ries operator. So P lower plus S, and I will define the Ries operator in this way. And I will denote P minus S, the one that can enters instead in the definition of uh, the fractional powers of LS. So there are two different operators. They are not semi-group. That's the whole game. These two operators, P over S, P over minus S, are not semi-group, OK? So uh, here is the main theorem that we can prove. So I over 2S inverse L over S, where L over S is defined by this formula here. By formula here with uh, in the case of the Heisenberg group Branson Fontana more Purgo definition was proved using a, a group representation theory by Roncal and Tangavelo. So we forget completely about group representation theory. We introduced by fiat this operator here and we proved that that operator is inverted by this operator with a p lower plus s and the main theorem is here. All right, so now I will finish. And uh, so, uh, you know, this function, the kernel of this operator as in the classical case. So the kernel of the conformal risk operators will provide an explicit fundamental for L over S. And so here is my last theorem. So let G be a group of Eisenberg type. And so when I integrate in time the kernel of that operator, I get that explicit constant, the monster constant that I wrote before, divided by the Korani gauge norm at the power raised to the power Q minus 2S. So that shows that the operator L lower S, despite the fact that they are so difficult to define and to somehow handle if you use uh, the analog of the counterpart of Fourier analysis. So you have to use non-commutative Fourier analysis and therefore group representation theory, Laguerre calculus on this ambience. But if you avoid all that and just look at the, at a suitable, uh, you know, if you look at this problem with the lenses of the suitable heat equations, then somehow these objects become transparent. So, and, uh, so this is uh, my last result. And when you put S equal to one in this formula, then you recover uh, the formula, the classical formula of Holland, going back to 1973. Uh, thank you for your patience and uh, for being here. And for some of you, probably at a somewhat later time in the evening. So that's, that's all. Oh, I forgot to tell you that uh, there was uh, some uh, 
essential bibliography. And uh, of course, for those of you who are interested, since the slides will be available, uh, the papers are listed here. Okay, so. Uh, Thanks a lot, Nicola, for your I beautiful. Apologize for. Uh, I'm sorry, Henry. Uh, thanks a lot for your beautiful and inspiring talk. So I wonder if there are questions or comments from the audience. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, okay. Hi, Nicola. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Can you um, just go back to your definition of L underscore S? Um, for I, the... cannot, I cannot see you. I cannot see you, David, but uh, I'm sorry. So uh, please ask me again because I, I uh, missed can, your can last you... words. So. Uh, can you show me the definition of L underscore S again, uh, the, the explicit spectral formula? Sure, 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 sure. It's right here. 023 formula, yes. 023. Okay. So, um, is it, so you have this in, integral. Oh, uh, yep. If you replace. T minus S comma T by the standard uh, heat semi-group. Uh, definition of L upper S. So the difference here <clears throat> is that there is this uh, lower minus S comma T. And once again, we have to be careful because that is not a semi-group. Okay. Um, do you do you know if L underscore S has um has a Levy Kinchin representation by any chance? Um, because I know um, P. I know. Okay, I see. Very interesting. Okay, uh, maybe maybe I can ask you more in the coffee break um, about zero point two three. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean I say. I mean I'm a bit worried that when you ask about Levy Kinchin representation because. Uh, 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 presumably, that uses uh, semi-group uh, mm. properties, yes. and uh, this operator is not the semi-group properties. Yes, yeah. That's the main difficulty that we had to face mm. in uh, manipulating these operators. I see. So that somehow we had to make up for the lack of uh, chapman kolmogorov equation. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Other questions or comments? I was wondering how much this analysis really rely on the extension property? Um, it does in a crucial way, actually. Uh, because in order to construct uh, these two kernels, K lower S and K lower minus S, we had to construct uh, first the fundamental solution for the extension property, for the extension operator. And so, I mean, when you look at it like this, well, I mean, of course I can give it to you by fiat, right? But, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a little bit deceitful to just uh, look at this definition down here because uh, the way we get got to it is uh, by understanding first the extension problem and this uh, here is uh, well i mean uh, actually we don't even use the uh, directly to neumann map here the, the property of being the uh, directly to neumann map directly so, um, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's pretty substantial, uh, the fact that uh, this uh, K lower S or K lower minus S uh, come from uh, uh, taking, uh, rescaling the fundamental solution of the extension operator. I mean, it's hidden in many ways in the calculations, but uh, 
you know, uh, it, it, yours is a legitimate question because if you look at the, uh, you know, the definition here, you know, you, you, you could say, well, I mean, I go to the next slide and I take uh, K lower S to be this function. But where does that come from? I mean, how do you guess it? Yeah. Other questions or comments? Well, if not, we can thank yeah, Nicole. Is, sorry, there is one more question from okay. in chat from Fausto Ferrari. Ciao, Fausto. Uh, except that I cannot hear the question. I don't know. Okay, Fausto, you can talk now. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Fausto. Oh, thank you, Nicola. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is uh, this one. Um, can you write uh, uh, your L underscore S like a principal value integral using uh, the kernel that you obtained? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, but uh, Lutzron Kahl and uh, Veluma Tangavelu did this, uh, but uh, uh, their representation only holds when S is between zero and one half. So it does not cover the full range zero to one. Uh, whereas uh, <clears throat> if you keep working, uh, as we did with uh, this Balakrishnan type representation, but I'm saying type because you really don't have a semi-group, uh, but nonetheless, you can do lots of computations. And uh, we uh, have a feeling that uh, in this way, you can actually cover uh, the full range of all positive S unless you know S is an integer, of course. Uh, so you have to stay away from, uh, you know, from the poles that come from that uh, explicit constant there. But uh, so I think that this uh, uh, heat equation representation uh, is more flexible in a way than uh, the one a la Marcel Ries using the principal value. That, that's my bias, but, however. Okay. No, because in the paper with uh, Bruno Franchi, we obtained uh, the representation with respect to uh, the principal value integral with a different kernel. And uh, that's so right. I was I... curious to understand if there is the possibility with L underscore S to obtain what really happened also in the Euclidean case, where you have morally, uh, you have the kernel that it is related uh, in a sense with the gauge norm that produces the fundamental solution like uh, you proved in your case. Yes, but uh, you know, once again, I, uh, you know, I think that uh, Roncal and Tangavelu uh, uh, do have this result in the in the paper, uh, but uh, it, it only covers the range zero to one half due to some properties. Uh, I mean, or lack of some properties, and it's likely that, uh, possible to extend it to all values between zero to one. I mean, I don't think that this is the main issue. But my main concern with the principal value representation is, uh, is of a different nature, is uh, that uh, mm, it's not as flexible as the heat equation representation in this, uh, for this specific operator. This specific operator is uh, completely different, as you will know, from the operator that you treated in the paper with uh, Bruno. Frankie, uh, because yours was more like the Caffarelli Sylvester extension problem. Right? I agree. Okay, uh, thank I don't you. Know if you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. I can. 
Okay, so I'm saying that uh, these are two very different problems. And uh, 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 so I think that it is possible to write uh, the, uh, uh, the principal value representation uh, in this case. And uh, Roncal and Tancavelo have already done it in the range between zero to one half. And uh, it is likely that uh, working harder, uh, one can extend it to the full range zero to one but, but, yeah, that okay. So, so the answer to your it's huh? clear. Please, thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Other questions or comments? Well, if not, we thank. Nicola again for his very kind availability, and we can meet in the uh, in the coffee break room and have some chat. Yeah, uh, everyone should have received an email about uh, Zoom connection to the coffee uh, coffee. Oh, break. so it's a, it's a different uh, it's a di different connection from this. Different one. connection, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Uh, let me see uh, uh, if I, all right, so, uh, so I will, uh, uh, so um, I apologize, Enrico, where, where or Ben, where to, which uh, link should I connect for the coffee? I think you should you you should have a, a new email with the information how to connect to Coffee Break. Okay, okay. So I just look up for Coffee Break in the email. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. So I so I will switch to the other connection then. Yeah. So I will close the meeting now. Yeah.